Enter the Path Mayo Experience. Path Mayo Experience. Path Mayo Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by DraftKings 2022 Masters Millionaire Maker DraftKings picks and preview range by range. You want to hit a specific range like the $7,000 range? Time codes, easy stuff down in the description. Reminder to everyone, share this show around, please. Smash the like button of the episode, subscribe to Mayo Media Network on YouTube and give me your two favorite plays on DraftKings at the Masters below $7,500. The more you put in there, the more information that we can aggregate, then we're going to know who chalk is going to be, at least by the time that Wednesday rolls around. We are recording this before the conclusion of the Valero Texas Open. I'm going to re-up on Tuesday, DraftKings-wise, with Rick Gaiman as we go player by player on the Pat Mayo Experience both video and audio podcast. Then Wednesday, noon Eastern time on Mayo Media Network. If you want to watch it live and ask your questions, myself and Tyler Tambellini will be answering your questions then and really hammering down on the ownership projections, the final bets, the final plays, the pivot plays that we're looking at for all this. But there are three things that you need to know before we start. One, play in the Listener's League. It's 5,000 spots this week. It's already filling up quickly because I've already released the research show with Justin Ray and my walkthrough at FantasyNational.com. That's down in the description. $75,000 of guaranteed rake-free money. Let's fill that up because when the PGA Championship comes along, I want to have $100,000 of guaranteed rake-free money. So the quicker we fill this up, the better that's going to be. FantasyGolfChampionships.com. A brand new one-and-done is taking place starting at the Masters $100 to play. It's 1,100 spots, $10,000 to first prize. One pick per week. Can't use the same player twice. Easy stuff. Find the link down in the description. And finally, do you want to get your hands on some Masters swag like this hat? These visors, probably not the visors. You, you'll have your pick if you end up winning. Get the hat, let's see. This uh, green version of the sweater that I'm currently wearing. A nice black polo, all from the official Masters store on site. All you need to do to get into the draw to win those and potentially a free ticket into the one and done is... Subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast. We need your help on this. The more reviews we can get, the better. So even if you've already done it, this re-ups you into everything. Apple Podcast, five-star review. Make something up you like. Twitter handle or email in that review. And boom, you're in that draw. We'll be announcing the one and done winner on Monday. But keep doing it. Do it as many times as possible. If you've never done it, try to do it 18 times. You've already done it. Just you know, re-up everything. We're trying to go for number one here in terms of the number one golf podcast, the number one gambling podcast, the number one fantasy sports podcast for Masters Week. That's above football, above baseball, above everything else, and we need your help in order to do this. So please, if you've ever been on the fence of doing it, I'm giving away stuff for free to you people to do less than 30 seconds of work. Anyway, it's enough of me rambling on. What we need to do now is talk through the Millionaire Maker slate. So you can either get information from Ben Raza from awesomeo.com, who once won, what was it, Ben, over 100K at the Masters when Patrick Reed won? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, a couple hundred K. It was the largest of the Millie makers. I wish it was a million up top. It wasn't at the time, but hopefully this will be the week for me. You never know. So Ben has a great track record at Augusta National on DraftKings. Tyler Tambellini, toe tag and Tambo from runpuresports.com is here, as he will be for the live chat on Wednesday as well. You won 100K like two weeks ago. Yeah, I'm trying to go back. Like Ben just said, there, it is a nicer time around. We've got three millionaire makers on DraftKings, 15, $100. And if you want to go for the mega, 4444. So excited to get back to it and hopefully have some of the success that Ben's had there as well. So you can get these guys who win like six figures on DraftKings from time to time, or someone who, when they don't lose all their money in any given week, it's a real success. That would be me. So be careful about what I say about all these guys. Game theory, we're so far out from actually locking in lineups. You and I were discussing it before the show, Tambo, that like Wednesday, we'll go reserve our seats and everything, but really finalize down on lineups. We know where ownership is going to come in because ownership as we perceive it today is not necessarily what it's going to be. We ran into this at the players when we recorded on the weekend. Jeez, Paul Casey's going to be super chalky. Didn't turn out to be the case because Casey had the worst weekend of all time. And that's going to happen with the Valero if how Lucas Glover wins the Valero, all of a sudden he's 25% owned. He's an easy fade. If he doesn't win, no one's going to use him. So results do directly affect what's going on. But where do you see the builds that you think that you're going to go after right away? 
Yeah, definitely some good strategy stuff to this. I compare it a little bit. I wrote my notes just to have a quick conversation off the top. But US Open, right? When we go to that, we've got the guys up top. We've got all these same guys, but then we have a bunch of qualifiers and amateurs at the bottom. At the Masters, it's kind of the same. Brooks Kepka-esque, if you will. Cross some of these guys off. There's just absolutely no chance. I think you've talked about it in the past and maybe even your shows this week where, look, even if this guy, Freddie Couples, comes through and makes the cut, he's not scoring for you on DraftKings. So you have to keep that in mind as well. So for me, looking a little bit more at the balance builds, we'll talk about it when we go through the ranges, but as much as I'll have one of these guys up top, I've got no problem using them and then dropping down some of the ranges. But typically, only one 6K guy finds his way to the top. Corey Connors, Kisner a couple years ago. If you look back at some of the Millie Maker winning lineups, that tends to be the case. Ben, do you think that's because the pricing is usually pretty soft for the Masters, where when you build these balanced lineups, like, I don't know, just looking at the pricing right now, if you were to start your teams with like Hovland and Cameron Smith, like you can still fit in four guys over $7,000. Yeah, I mean, normally when we're talking about a typical week, uh, not to say that guys in like the, the mid sevens and low eights can't win a tournament, that would be crazy, but just the talent and, and the depth of the talent in something like the Masters is immense. So the balance build is there. The one difference with Augusta and some of the other majors, this is not a full field. So it's almost like a hybrid WGC, but there is a slight cut. So that is a weird thing that we don't really deal with throughout the year, but that is how I approach it. I'm looking at the bottom of the pricing, and you kind of hit on it. I went over this on the research show as I dug into the DraftKings pricing a little bit and DraftKings scoring. And these guys at the bottom, where there isn't a lure, because you'll remember Bernhard Langer came in 11th place the year that Willett won. Reminder, that was six years ago, (laughs) for one thing. Like, Fred Couples came inside the top 25 years ago, and people were, oh, man, you got to use Freddie Couples. He came T18. It's like, well, he was like 34th in DraftKings scoring. So he needed his best overall performance. That's the best Fred Couples is going to do, is finish inside the top 20. And he wasn't outscoring guys that came in 35th place. Yeah, that's going to be the problem. There, that's the other thing about Augusta. Like, people forget that, I think, sometimes. that this, There's scoring to be had. There's eagles out there. A lot of around the green stuff where you could find that chip in eagle. Just random scoring like that for the bonuses. So, I would, I just would take your chances on guys that actually have the upside. Uh, you're not going to get there on a T49 or something in most cases. And with the field being so condensed, Ben, that you kind of hit on it. That even if your guy makes the cut, like, that's no great shakes. Like, If a guy comes T51 in a field of 91st, he's not going to be in a winning lineup. Yeah, I mean, 6-6 is, is of course, necessary, but uh, don't go car shopping if you have all six through the weekend. There's a lot of people who will do that and not even cash in this. What do you think? I mean, it's really difficult to know who ends up missing the cut. Obviously, if we knew that and we were from the future, we could probably (laughs) give better advice on this. But 25, 30% 6 6 is usually what we're looking at? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, barring something crazy, I think that's fair. All right, well, let's dig into the pricing then. $10,000 range. Tambo, you mentioned this at the players, but this is a better example, I think, with WGCs, the Masters field in specific, only because it's 91 players, that you pick your guys and then smash those guys. That's what I'd like to do here. Yeah, specifically, just because, like I said, I'm only gonna, you're only going to want so many lineups, in my opinion, where you're going with this. But if you're using these guys, you can still do sort of a, a hybrid balance where you're using a top stud. You and I talked about this past week with Vegas and List. Let's hop down to that range and then go down. They were in the 8K. You can do the same thing here. There is good players in the 8K range. Up top, I think Rory is a different conversation because we got to wait and see what he does this week here at the Valero. That will change things. But then I think he's more of a conversation with the guys below in Cam Smith and Jordan Speed the two guys with the magic beans so it's more a discussion up at the top and I, you know, I wonder Ben's thoughts even yours too like just on the sense of Rom, DJ, JT, Scheffler these are better upper tier guys that are coming in with some stuff that people are still going to want to play quite a bit of these guys well Ben the overall pricing right now Scotty Scheffler is the most expensive player which tracks because he's the number one player in the world as weird as this that's really weird to say out loud, but here we are with three wins in his past five starts. 11,000 bucks. Rom's 10 8. DJ is 10 5. JT is 10 3. Morikawa 10 2. Hovland 10 1. And Rory is $10,000 even. Rory misses the cut at Valero. No one is going to be on Rory. Rory wins at Valero. He's 35% owned, is what I'm thinking. That's what I think. So, yeah. What uh, do we do? I don't. The way he's playing, he's more. Uh, I'm a little worried about him finding that weekend. I could use that. I don't want him to win. I'm going to play Rory at Augusta. There's no doubt. Uh, if Scheffler, I'll get it out right now. If Scheffler, who's playing the best in the world, wins again, 
uh, you won't be seeing me uh, on the leaderboards. That's for sure. I just can't pay 11000 for him. You see, you say that, though. But once we get back to the ownership projections on Wednesday, Tambo, we're going to see Scotty Scheffler's like 7% owned. Because yeah. no, I think everyone has the same knee-jerk reaction to it. It's like, why would I pay $11,000 for Scotty Scheffler when I can pay $200 less for John Rahm, who dominates at Augusta despite never winning? That's going to be the case for sure. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That was the next note I had. Like if they had a flipped it and made Scotty 10-8 and, and Rom 11, maybe there was a decision to be had. I know it's only 200 bucks and it flip-flops, but right now I'm with Ben. Uh, look, if the guy wins again, it'd be crazy, but I just can't do it. I'm going to take my chances on a guy like Rom. I'm going to play other guys that we'll talk about here. If, if Scotty beats us, it's one of those things, Pat, where even if he is 7%, and the game theory, you and I are talking on Wednesday, like, don't we just have to get 15%? You don't have to. Like, is he going to go out and crush the St. 11K? There's so many guys below him that can win here that if he does it, he does it. Good for him. And like you said, it was weird to even say number one in the world. If you say number one in the world and another win and at Augusta and Green Jacket, now you're getting a little bit crazy with it. I, I just can't do it personally. So looking at who I think is going to be the highest owned, and again, this is going to shift throughout the week. Everyone can go to fantasynational.com slash mayo to get yourself 20% off if you're building these lineups or you're making bets. That way you can track the ownership percentages in real time. You can generate lineups, use the simulator, and do all of your own research and select the guys that you actually want. Rom and JT are going to be, right now, the two highest owned, Rory pending on what he does. That leaves Scheffler, DJ, and Morikawa as the three most likely not to be used. When I talked with Justin Ray, he was kind of reading the same tea leaves that I was with Morikawa. Like, why not? Why he's won two of the last eight majors. No one wants to play him. <laughs> the price. 10, 10 two. That's a great price for the guy who's won. I mean, we got Scotty Scheffler. He won oh. three like jabroni, of, well, not jabroni events, but he didn't win two majors. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on that. I'm saying, but that that's just what still gets people, right? They still look at more cow. That's what you said. Why don't they want to? They did it at the Open. They've done it everywhere. It always just comes down. It just seems expensive, even though he's done crazy things in the time. Uh, for me, the guy is actually Dustin Johnson. And we'll, I'll go there now. I just wanted to say it because if you go back, even before like the, the match play that he just had, first off, cancel the consolation match. Guy doesn't care at all. <laughs> he basically, like we said on the Wednesday show, gifted it to Corey Connors. Corey took forever to accept the gift, but he finally got it and, and got away with the third place there. But you could tell DJ just flipped the switch off after that. Before that, playing incredibly well. You go back to the players, weather stuff all aside, that last round, round four, record tying round at Sawgrass, like he's brought his game up as many of these guys do for the right time. This is when they want to peak. They don't care about every little thing that goes on throughout the year. They show up to play. This is the time for him. And he squeezed between the two guys I agree with you on, Rom and Thomas, who are just going to pick up that ownership regardless of anything else. So I kind of like Dustin Johnson there in the middle, a little more than Morikawa, but I don't hate the thought. Ben, when I went through my like trends research, which is real uh, non-scientific when you go and look at it, that Hideki kind of blew it up last year, although he had a top 20 at the API before winning. So all these guys have a top 20 finish like somewhere in each of their past three starts who have won this tournament or basically since Charles Schwartz. Even Charles Schwartz in 2011 had a 14th at the Honda Classic coming in, but mainly it had been two top 15 finishes almost like per year for the previous eight winners. Hideki blows that up a year ago, but Dustin would actually fit that despite him not seeming like he's playing all that good at golf, which is really funny to think about. Yeah, I think, you know, the expectations with him were not out of whack. He just didn't start extremely strong. He had a crazy Sunday at the players. And now it looks like he is rounding into form. Tambo talked about this, a great sandwich price. When, when guys are in between two popular guys, they're really lost. Uh, for me, with Morikawa and Hovland, it's the same question I always ask. Is there, if they're not crisp with their irons, can they survive around the green? No. Uh, that's not their strong suit. I worry about that. It catches them at some time. Sometimes they're so good that it masks. So I think that's the risk you take. I would rather play DJ than Morikawa as well, though. I think I'm kind of on the same line. I think that a lot of people are going to come around to that line of thinking once they see that, like, oh, Rom's going to be 22% owned and Justin Thomas is going to be 20% owned. It's like, oh, I'll just use DJ. And then all of a sudden he's 20% owned as well. <laughs> Yeah, if we, if we see that again, that could be the case. We talked about it last time at the player show. You mentioned it in a lower range with a guy like Casey, but it could most definitely be the same thing here because Rom is going to pick it up. Everyone wants to talk about it. We didn't mention a lot on him, but guy looks like he's going to put on a green jacket at some point. You know, eventually it's he a should. That's a big green jacket. It really is. He's a big man. But, you know, you think about even like the Sergio stuff back in the day, everything, just like he's lining up for it. He looks so good. And then all the stats. You just did the show with Justin Ray. You look at it. His approach and everything has been fine. That's what's been good. It's he just has to find the puck 
putter. And then you go to these greens, very fast, sloping, undulations, all that we talk about with Augusta. And that's where he can find it and start picking it back up. Looking at the past 50 rounds, I ran my custom model, which people can find on the research show up on Mayo Media Network right now. I walk through how I got to this point. One, two, and three, Rom, JT, and Rory, Ben. Sounds like a good time to me. Uh, <laughs> my biggest question up here is how often, and kind of asking myself on the show, how often will I double up? Will I take Rory in one of them? Because that's a build I'd love to get to. I just don't know how much strain it's going to put. I'm thinking right now that if uh, I'm kind of with you with starting with Dustin, I also love Morikawa, but I'm I'm a slut for Morikawa. Like, he's <laughs> my guy. He's won me so much money over the course of the past two years, and people will legitimately not play him yeah. here. And even looking back, I mean, the, the only lingering thought from the match play from Morikawa is that he got dusted by answer. Morikawa hadn't lost like a hole before that in the previous he had not been trailing in the previous three matches he has one bad round combined with answer having a really great round and all of a sudden you're kaput that's what happens in match play i mean you said like dj lost to Corey connors although he didn't care we think it about looked it. like he didn't care so, yes. but you can like adam scott had kisner dead to rights he was up three with four to go and he lost outright so different stuff can happen for i mean that's a classic adam scott type move we'll talk about him in a second <laughs> yeah. i've already bet him to win so i know what's happening in that <laughs> regard but uh, there's just something with Morikawa that he doesn't have the overwhelming power and distance that you would necessarily want at Augusta but I was really impressed with him last year at this tournament because I was kind of off him I'm like and Justin even pointed it out you want to have the best iron players in the world at Augusta you don't necessarily have to be the longest players and with his putting you're going to know after like 20 minutes whether he's got it that week or not because some weeks when he has it he doesn't miss usually the case. That's what we say with Morikawa, and that's why you play. It's it's un, it's unfortunate, but the price that goes with it, that's why I say it still may seem fair, but we always say, like, Luke List, if he just finds a putter at 7,600. Now, Morikawa finds it a bit more at often At least he's only 7,600, though, and we have to wait for that to happen. Morikawa, it's tough. And then JT right above him. So, like you said, when we get to Wednesday, if JT's showing up at 20% and Morikawa's showing up at 7, that's when I think, again, the switch will be flipped. The people will go to a DJ on the squeeze, and maybe your play comes out correct, and that ends up being accurate. I just, like I said, it's a hard time at you know everything else we have going on up top you can't play everybody and Ben's question was more interesting too I think about like can you double up up here and I think you could with like a Kawa Rory to your point because they are a bit on that lower end and you don't stretch yourself too thin at the bottom but you'll end up skipping what we'll get to in a second in the very popular 9k range where you now you can't play them you just have to skip them by nature it's going to be really difficult to parse accurate ownership information. I always find the Masters is by far the toughest. Because I'm looking at Fantasy National right now, and even when you look at the nine, someone like Spieth, Ben, looks like he's going to be wildly under -owned. But we know that's just not going to be the case. No, he, he's going to steam. He's also another player. He is in Valero, so we'll see. He's actually playing pretty well right now. So, uh, And then we've got... I mean, talk about a guy that I know I'll never get right. Cameron Smith sitting <laughs> basically at 10K. The one putt wizard had finishes here. He's playing, you know, not Scotty Scheffler, but it's pretty close. So he's another guy that it's going to be a tough, uncomfortable fade, but it's also an uncomfortable price tag, in my opinion. Right now, Cameron Smith projects to be the highest owned player on the slate. Well, that's it for me. There's <laughs> no chance I get over then. Xander Shoffley, also in the nines at 9,600, also projects over 20% right now, which stuns me, to be perfectly honest with you. Because it seems like the narrative surrounding Xander is that he's not any good right now. Before, it was like he wasn't all that great. He would have all these thirds and fifths, sort of like Scheffler in a weird way. But he just never broke through outside of the Olympics. But now he's kind of gone into the Finau zone from like two years ago from last year where it's like, oh yeah, this guy who constantly comes inside the top 10 doesn't get over the hump. It feels like the sentiment has really shifted on him. Doesn't seem like people are buying that whatsoever. He's probably, I thought he was a great play coming in. I don't think he's a great play at 25% ownership. Yeah, and you said a couple things there. One for sure is it's crazy what a win does versus a second place. Look at his track record, not just here, but just in general, all the great courses. Xander's always up there. His top 10% clip is insane, but the fact that he doesn't close the door, like you said, puts him almost in the Fino, and it doesn't help when you've got the Schefflers, Hovlins, Morikawas, all these guys that are popping up. Neiman just won the Genesis. Like everybody else seems to be out doing something, but I thought about it on the way over. That's the second thought, is that like he seemed like a sneaky play, but he, Xander is the sneaky play that everyone thinks is sneaky till he's not and it's already coming out earlier with the data these days where you've got it in front of you now so I think the sneaky play is below him and I know he doesn't have a great track record here but Patrick Cantlay at 9,500 a completely different golfer this last year and has done so much that you know 
winning player of the year. People want to take away everything. Sure, take away the COVID situation at the Memorial. Sure, take away that extra one stroke at the Tour Championship. It doesn't really take away from what he did all season long and how good he was. I think he can find a better path here. Full 9K range, Cam, Spieth, Xander, Cantley at 95, Brooks at 94, Hideki, Zalatoris, Bryson, and Berger. So there's a bunch of guys who are injured coming into this, and they all seem like they're going to play. First up is Hideki, pulled out and screwed everyone over at the Players' Championship. Well, not us, because, you know, thanks to you, we were on, or that guy that tweeted that. The guy that tweeted us had had us covered. He was on it. We believe that one. Valero, Texas Open, he tees up for a round. Then we don't see him. He WDs. So now we're going with the defending champion who's played like one competitive round over the past six months and keeps withdrawing from tournaments due to a neck injury. Then you have Bryson sitting at $9,100 who returned from a two-month absence at the match play, looked rusty, and frankly looked pretty rusty at Valero in his opening round. He didn't hit driver, even on the par fives. He was hitting three iron, three woods off the tee. So I don't know where he's at with his ham bone injury. And I didn't like him at Augusta anyway. So you have these two guys there, Ben. Are they just cross-offs? So I think in single entry and three max and stuff, they may be a little too thin. If you're talking about the Millie, the, the, the least expensive Millie, particularly with Hideki, I think he's still in play. Uh, I don't like Bryson, not because of all this stuff. I just don't think he's a great fit at Augusta. But Hideki, on the other hand, of course, we've seen it. And I, I do think he's a, a good long-term fit. We don't know. He could WD. He could just not have it. Uh, so I wouldn't allocate a ton, but if you're telling me I can take 10% of Hideki and get like 2.5 X or something, I'll gladly do that. I would imagine right now I'm seeing 7% ownership on Hideki and most of these lineups were generated before the WD at Valero. I'm thinking he's like 3%. Exactly. So am I. And I'm willing to burn one tenth of, of large field tournament entries on a guy like that. Now you... Tambo or someone who plays 150 lineups. Ben will play 150 lineups in a millionaire maker. Do you have that same sort of strategy? I'm not playing 150 lineups. I'll probably play 25, 50. He's not making my build. Yeah, he's gonna make mine in the in like Ben said, the fifteen dollar, uh, the hundred dollar. Uh, it's, it's tough. The thing is, like I said, do you, you want to donk off a thousand bucks on Hideki, basically? Probably not. But but at the end of the day, like you said, the the difference is he, you know, Brooks, Cantlay, all the guys that are around makes it challenging. I do think there's a chance, honestly, just by what the Japanese media was putting out. Now that I got that tweet, I can follow all this stuff, and I was trying to translate it on Google and everything. Uh, he actually could withdraw before. So I don't, I mean, this conversation could be totally different come Wednesday. It sounds like that, it just reflared up. And if that's the case and he tried nine holes today and it didn't work, is it going to be solved? And does he just go out because he's the, the, the defending champion? Or does he give the respect and say, unfortunately, I can't go for the dinner and not show up. We'll have to wait and see. But if he's in, I will definitely take some in something like the $15 because at 9,300, he is a fair price for a guy that has it around this course. And especially as someone who's already won this year, he has three wins in the past 12 yeah. months. Like you... Liking Hideki at this price seems super easy. It's a guy it, under him who never wins for a hundred bucks less. Your guy, Will Zalatoris, <laughs> who uh, who gained, I believe, 9.6 strokes putting at the Masters last year en route to a second place finish. Yep. And he was going to win the match play as a new putter and every, they, they thought he was about to win that too. But hey, I make fun of the guy. The best part that came out of me, the slander for Will Zalatoris was my guy, Kenny Kim, posting that, by the way, he shows up like at the same clip as Scheffler, Hovland, and Morikawa at all these big tournaments. He just doesn't win any of them. And here, that's okay at 9,200. So I'm going back to him again and I'm with Ben on Bryson. I didn't care if he if he won this week. I would I wish he won this week so that A, it would help my lineups this week because we the answer bet on went him out. And, yes. <laughs> the bets but i'm saying i just don't think it's a good fit for him man like he's yes you can get away with things off the tee at augusta national but you still have to have your complete game after that and then don't forget the greens books which has been his problem and widely talked about that he doesn't have it when he doesn't have those that's important at augusta he hasn't worked out before i don't think he's going to work out again i like zalatoris he's currently the number 29 player in the world obviously that will get readjusted after the valero it's not like he's in any danger of missing the masters but charles schwartzel the number 29 player in the world, won he won the Masters. Trevor Immelman, the number 29 player in the world. Can we just put a South African flag next? Can he do a reverse Sabatini? Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's a lock to win, I think. Yeah, it's definitely a good week to play. 9,200 is fair. He can be your third guy into your lineup. That's why I said I'm talking about some of these balanced builds. There, there's an opportunity, more likely your second talking lineup construction, but the fact that he's 9,200, he could be your third in. Cantley, Brooks, Zalatoris, Berger, all in this bottom part of the $9,000 range. Ben, with the build that you were talking about, like Rory with another 10K guy, you're not getting to this range. But if you started Rory or started Morikawa or Hovland in those bottom 10s, you could 
not feasibly take two of these guys, but you could take two of these guys if you wanted to. Yeah, both of those, I think, are, are very effective builds. You'll fully leverage in terms of the fade. If you go north of 10 twice, you won't play any nines, most likely. And that's fine. I think this range is pretty volatile. Or you could say, you know what, there's a lot of win equity here. I'm going to fade more of the top and take two or three of these guys because I, I like Cantlay as well. Uh, Will Z, you know, certainly talented. And then, I mean, Xander, Xander, I don't. I don't mess around with that. I never get him right. Played him at the players. Not great. But other than that, it's a pretty interesting range. Even a guy like Berger, I don't have a great feel of how popular he'll be. I doubt it because I think the overwhelming narrative around Daniel Berger at Augusta is that he's not any good. Yeah. Because he's gotten progressively worse every year that he's played it, which is kind of crazy. He was a debutante in the Willett year, came in 10th. And then you look at his results, it's like 10th, 24th. 37th, miscut. And then he didn't even qualify for that weird November Masters, although he was like the 13th ranked player in the world. That was bad, yeah. So I I think he'll be low. I think what we're looking at right now are Cam and Xander above everyone else. And these are, again, just the early projections. Then you'll have Spieth, Zalatoris, and Cantlay, and Brooks somewhere in the middle. Berger a step below them in terms of overall ownership. Right now, outside of Bryson and Hideki, I'm guessing Morikawa is going to be the lowest owned of anyone above $9,000. Yeah, that would look about right. And I think Ben had a good take there too, just about the win equity factor. And that's where we're going to get into the AK range in a moment. But like you look down there, to me, there's way more win equity in here. And everything you're saying lines up perfectly for my game plan going in. It is early, but if you look at the factor of Cam Smith, Jordan Spieth, Xander Schauffele having the ownership the guys down below, it's going to be tougher to get to. If I'm going to have a tough time getting down there, it means others are as well. And the thing about the bottom range is if, you know, I'm okay, I'm with Ben. Like, I don't want to play, I call him Scam Smith. Everyone, Someone asked me this week, last week, why don't you, we talked to the show, someone tweeted me, why do you hate him? I, I hate him because I never get him right. I don't actually hate the guy, he's a good dude probably, but when I play him, he sucks. When I don't play him, he's making everything. So it's easy to go away from him. And it's easier for me to go away from Xander, especially because I like the guys below. Speeth is the one I have the trouble with because I just said it every time no matter in his worst days this is the course he still shows up at so how do you go away from Spieth regardless of ownership just ignore it maybe let him slide into a few if you're already off Cam and Xander well Ben I think it works out all right in terms of Spieth's ownership because people are going to own Spieth just to own Spieth obviously but if Smith and Xander are soaking up so much ownership it will keep Spieth's in check like I'm seeing him at seven percent right now I would guess he comes in at 16 percent is that Unless he wins, then he'll be like 40%. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be somewhere in that range, but I love what you said, where they are going to soak up some on either side. Nobody gets to completely get out of control, but I am wondering if by Wednesday, people say, scam Smith and just move it over to Spieth. I mean, if you're going to back Spieth at basically the same price as Cameron Smith, you might as well just use Cameron Smith, logically speaking, because <laughs> they're doing the same things, except Cameron Smith is way better at the moment. Right now. And he has a good Augusta track record as well. It's not like he's been shit at the Masters over the years either, so... I just, just every year I can just picture it in my head. The the David Jane tweet with Bart Simpson writing on the chalkboard, do not fade Spieth at the Masters. That's the one. And if you play him every single year, you've been doing pretty well. I I don't I forget the number, but it's on a lot of Millie Maker winners. Just even if he didn't win the year, it was still he showed up that year. So it's a guy that you just don't want to avoid. And like I said, I think I'm just going to be comfortable playing him no matter what. And then if I get Cantlay, Kepka, uh, Berger, I think you said one other thing that stood out to me, Pat, and it'll apply to the rest that we talk about. But just the overwhelming theme isn't just like Berger's history here. It's just history here. So that when it goes with Berger and it goes with Cantlay and guys like that who haven't had a great history here, people just naturally want to move off them like they couldn't all of a sudden be better or show up for one year. And that's not the case. We know this. And that'll get me onto those guys. Are you going to play Speed then? Uh, yeah, I think I might play him a little bit. There needs to be a significant discount in terms of the projected ownership off. Like if he's half the ownership of a guy like Cam Smith, I'll be very, very comfortable doing that. I prefer the $200 to get to Rory, but uh, yeah, Spieth shows up here and it is truly one of the best courses he could ever play. So in terms of cross-offs above 9,000, and listen, I, I can change my mind. You can hit my cheat sheet up on DKNation.com, all of the updated picks on Tuesday for DraftKings purposes. But no Justin Thomas for me, no Cam Smith for me. And this is just a, just a preliminary, just like cross people off. No Hideki, no Bryson, no Berger. And then I'll have to start making some decisions. I'm leaning no Rom at the moment using all Dustin Johnson. 
Okay. I'm, I'm with you on some, not on others. I can't do that with Rom, but like Scheffler, uh, Hovland, a guy we didn't talk about. He's been in Butler Cabin as a uh, top I, man. I but... want to keep Hovland because he's sort of out of sight, out of mind at the moment. And people love <laughs> Hovland. But if Rory, like A, Smith and Xander are right there and everyone wants to use Justin Thomas. So those are three guys projected to be in like the top five of ownership overall, right? Yeah. So those are going to be very popular plays. Probably two of those guys together, whether it's Justin Thomas, Xander, John Rom. Rob Justin Zander Thomas. is a popular pairing, like always. So yeah. I, I can see that one being popular here so, as well. So that's going to be super popular. And so you're going to have Hovland, who we always project out to be very highly owned because he's so popular every week. But if Rory shows any signs of life at Valero and he bumps his ownership up from like 10% to 18%, where does that leave Hovland? Like people can't just... People won't use him. He, no matter what happens with Rory, I don't think you can get to Hovland. Like you said, JT Rom alone, the DJ thoughts that will come out throughout the week. And then we already talked about those three from 9,600 to 9,900. They're right there. So, Ben, Morikawa Hovland starts. Morika- Morikawa Hovland together, you could do whatever you want uh, with the other four. That's going to be leverage, certainly at the top. Most people aren't going to play either, but to pair them, that would be one of the lowest combinations uh, of the double up 10K guys. If we go Morikawa, Hovland to kick things off, you have $7,400 remaining. And then once you throw Brooks into that, because Brooks is probably going to win, you still have $6,800 left for your final three spots. Find one jabroni you like from the bottom, and then you can hit up my favorite range. We'll eventually get to it. $7,107,000. The Pat Mayo All-Stars are just, <laughs> just, they're just so locked together. And no one's using my guys this year. They're using the other guys, which is great. Everyone wants to play old Kevin Kisner at $7,600. You have Kevin Kisner. Give me C. Woo! Kim on this team. But Morikawa, Hovland, Brooks, you can make that work. And I think that Brooks is a great play. I like him better than Cantley. Yeah, and just we talk the 2v2 every week. It's uh, it's JT and Rory, or it's Morikawa, Hovland. There's your 2v2 right there. And one is going to be much less owned in Morikawa and Hovland, the young guns. And like you said, that'll still fit all your guys you want to play with C. Woo down at the bottom. Can't fit my other guy into this. So any final thoughts on the tens and nines, Ben? Like maybe someone that we didn't talk about, a different type of construction that you're thinking with? No, not really. I mean, I, I think an interesting one would be starting Cam Smith and Spieth together. Uh, you know, again, you're going you're gonna to lean obviously heavily around the green, wizard putting. I think a lot of people are going to certainly click one of them. If you pair them together, that could be a way to mitigate some of the ownership combinations. You're going to have to do more work as you work down, but there's plenty of guys that fit that mold. Smith and Spieth starting off gives you $7,600 remaining for the play, for the next four players. I mean, obviously, if you're going to create that lineup, where's Mac Hughes? We can throw him in at 6,300. Here's your skill stacking of magic beans right away. Now you're back up yep. to 8,000 for your final three guys. Not that I love Mac Hughes, but... Canadian Jordan Spieth was in my notes. Hey, listen, so <laughs> listen, when you need like eagles and albatrosses and chipping in from God knows where, Mackenzie Hughes is the guy that you want to start looking up. No Sam Ryder here, so I have to go with Mac Hughes. Dear God. <laughs> He's the I almost said that. I can't. Yeah. Sa- Sam Ryder could eagle his way into Augusta potentially. That's true. He still has time. I, I doubt that that's going to end up being the case, but how comfortable are you with fading everyone above $10,000? I'm personally not. Yeah. I, I don't think in any lineup? None. Oh, oh, sorry. Like, I'm, de- I'm going to definitely have those balanced builds. That's where you're going with it. Like, yeah. I, I like what Ben said, but I actually like even going to like a Cantlay Brooks, a guy we didn't talk about a lot. Cantlay and Brooks starting point is incredible. That's to me, two guys that can go out and win this tournament. It is a major, so Brooks should care. And you remember the Justin Ray stack because you just had him on <laughs> of how well he just destroys fields in majors. So that has not changed. He showed signs of life. At the match play, the one mistake he made scares me a little bit is on 17, the par three against DJ. He just needed to go for center of the green, much like at the Masters Tiger one, when everyone should have just went for the center of that green on 12 and got their way through it. And he goes for like the staircase on the other side, bounces the ball over and loses that hole to DJ and in turn loses the match. That to me was like, eh, still not learning from your mistakes, Brooks. Well, you don't know exactly the motivation at play either. Maybe he had another dye job he had to do later that day. He's like, I can't win this match. I can't keep playing. I got to get my hair dyed again. I I love when Lowry pushed him back. I said the joke. (laughs) I think he told him, get away from me with that hair because Lowry, you know the way he is. But yeah, it's it's pretty bad for Brooks right now. We'll see what he does. I kind of like him here, though. It is a major. But if you want to go Cantlay, Brooks, Zalatoris, you still have 7,300 for your final three guys. That's, That's pretty spicy. I love it. And Brooks, I mean, we talk about win equity, and it's, listen, when we look at the odds and try to compare and contrast everyone, I would say Brooks has as good of a chance of winning this tournament as anyone else does. 
I think so. I, I don't think that changes. Like I said, it doesn't matter if it's the Masters or, oh, a U.S. Open, a PGA Championship. That's where the trophies come from. It doesn't matter. He stepped up at all of them. He still looked pretty good here. And like I said, what I like is what I've seen from him lately. Looks a lot better to me than what we've seen, you know, before this last couple of events. So I'm happy to have him here. $8,000 range, which I'm guessing is going to get somewhat overlooked, especially at the top, because the names aren't super attractive, because it's a bunch of guys that you wouldn't figure would be this price in a major. Louis, sure. $8,900, I can see that. Lowry, 88. Gooch, 87. Has Gooch ever played? He's a debutante, I believe. He is. At the Masters. So he's 87. Sam Burns, also, I believe, first time in the Masters is $8,600. Tiger Woods, $8,500. Sungjae, Adam Scott, Neiman, Finau, Hatton. That bottom part of the eights, I can see a lot of ownership going to. This top part of the eights is going to have relatively little ownership. Issue is, uh, Lowry, maybe? Louis, maybe? I, I don't know. It's Ben's range, isn't it? This is Louis. It starts with Louis, so we, we got to talk there. I mean, this is, what's Louis going to do? I, I feel like we haven't seen the same Louis. The putter hasn't been the same. But if it's going to set up for anybody, like th that's what Louis does. It's, a, it's the talk about Brooks just two seconds ago, isn't it, Ben? A, a Louis major? What do we think? It, so I, I do think that Louis is counterintuitive. It, like if he was revving, playing amazing, everyone would be saying, oh, Louis, sub nine, this is great. I don't, I don't think it really matters how he's playing if he comes in and he's focused and he's healthy. So I get it. This range is just a mixed bag, though. Like, Taylor Gooch at 80. If, if Taylor Gooch was 7,500, I wouldn't even be like, oh, that's great. I I don't understand that price. Don't know what to think of Sanjay. I like Scott and Neiman as we work down. I, is anyone going to play Tiger? I mean, I, I still am somewhat skeptical that he's even going to play. This is just a truly outrageous mixed bag of, of guys. I, if we obviously don't know at this time whether or not Tiger is going to play. So he'll announce that. I think if he says he's going to play, I think he's a play. He's, he fits into my Matsuyama theory from earlier, and I, I would use him even more than that because now you drop down in price at 8500 This is not Fred Couples or Long, Langer that know the course that might just show up. This is a guy that knows the course, has won it a bunch of times. If he's healthy enough to play, he's going to come through and play. So I definitely have no problem going to Tiger if he says he's going to play. I don't think that Tiger would step on that course without not necessarily being at the very peak of his powers, but he's definitely not going out there and shooting a fucking 81 or something like that. I just don't see it. Yeah, I can't see that in the least. It's not what Tiger's built around. If he has to say one more or wait till uh, what we've talked about all season, the Open at St. Andrews, much easier walk, if, if you will. But I don't know. If he's in, I'm playing him. I don't care. It's 8,500. You don't have to get too much to get over. What do you think his ownership percentage is going to be? 2%? I'd say a little. Really? I think higher if he plays because people just play the casual fans, whatever. But it's not going to be enough to talk about. But even in 2019 when he won, it's like he wasn't high owned. Yeah. I agree on that too. And the range is kind of ugly. I like what you brought up earlier. Like I only have two plays in here, Pat, and it's Shane Lowry, who you mentioned, uh, by the way, when he won the open, he had similar form to what he has right now. So I do like that about him coming in. He's got the complete game. I don't really care the conditions, good, bad, or ugly. He can show up and do well. We'll see whether as we get close to it, talk about it more on Wednesday, if that's the case. But I want to bring up Sam Burns, uh, especially if Woods plays. And I'll say this, it is interesting. Like first off, like to Ben's point, Gooch being a hundred bucks more than Burns, I'm lost. It makes no sense to me. It seems like a misprice completely. Burns being only his fifth major. I think for top debutant, I've even looked at him to win the thing. I just think we always talk about, we just did it on the Wednesday show. We talked about Adam Svensson being a Corey Connors light. Well, if we talk about guys in the light sense, I want to talk about Burns. I think he's Tony Finau heavy. I think he's the guy that just goes out and actually closes the door. He plays well. We like him. He's a fan he favorite. He just won you 100 k all he's right? We, all we, we know he's your guy. <laughs> uh, it wasn't even because of that. I think he closes the door more often than people might remember or think he has the complete all-around game he just showed it again at Valspar coming in which has been a bit of an indicator here and now at this price especially if anybody goes towards Louis Lowry Woods whatever how popular do we think Sam Burns gets I like him quite a bit this week and I think he's an interesting sort of core play that I can use in any type of lineup I can't imagine Sam Burns getting over 10 percent just because of the builds that we talked about, people will go more balance or they're going to go to the bottom. I bet Adam Scott to win $8,300. I don't think that he's going to be like overwhelming chalk. He might push 15%, but I would say the 10% is probably more likely. But, well, former Masters winner. He's putting the lights out somehow. He's yeah. figured that part out. He knows how to get around this course. And the irons have been fantastic. If he just drives the ball okay. That's all I'm looking for here. I'm not looking for him to lead the field off the tee. Just don't be, like, every few tournaments, he's just a disaster with his driver. Can't have that. But if he's just, like, okay, I think that he can figure this out.
Yeah, and I think he'd probably be... Le- I don't think he'll be very owned, actually. Just I know the bottom range will pick up ownership, but we just talked about Tony Finau. By the way, he finished T10 on his debut, and that's what Burns, I think, could pull off here and as well. And then Tony so. Finau broke his ankle and ended up coming T5 somehow, and no that, one used him. That was the one. That's what I'm saying. He broke his... <laughs> I think he like turned his ankle. We all thought it was broken. Then he came out and crushed. That's where I'm thinking we're going to see something. Not the ankle part, but with Sam Burns being able to show up. But I like what you said at the bottom. I also like the guys... I think Ben brought him up. Uh, Neiman... I, I just seems too cheap here for me a little bit. Like he could pick up some steam, but uh, Sergio's buddy, don't forget. So I'm sure he's getting some insight and some tips around the course and whatnot. But at 8,200 and Finau's right there below him and Scott's just above, I think he's a potential squeeze play that we can get get some action on as well. So trends, Ben, that I talked about before, this is the one. Nine straight Masters champions previous to Hideki Matsuyama had at least two top, fi- top 15 finishes in their three tournaments leading into the event. Shane Lowry would actually qualify underneath those circumstances. I believe that Sam Burns would actually qualify under that as well because he skipped the match weight at a first at the Valspar and a ninth at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Terrell Atten would be another one who would fall into that, whose Masters record is better than I remember. It's not good. I assumed, like, he's played in it five times. I thought he'd miss the cut every single time. He can't 18th last year. It's good enough for Pat. <laughs> he can show up, yeah, 8,000. And it'll be more interesting. He's in the conversation because the next range, we get to answer Sergio Henley, Fitzpatrick, all of those guys, and, of course, Connors and Casey. That's where you could just go up a little bit, and what's the difference? And Connors was actually, I mean, sorry, Hatton was actually playing well overseas before the recent PGA Tour run that he was on as well. He wasn't bad over there in the DP Tour World Championship. So uh, I think if you look at him, he's a, a fine play at 8,000 at the bottom below Fina. Yeah, he was 13th at the players, Ben second at the Arnold Palmer. He made it out of his group stage at the match, but he's playing some good golf. I, I like it. And, I, you know, it's the kind of guy, and we were alluding to this earlier, this course history stuff. These guys, you know, you, three or four times doesn't mean much. And even at the players, a lot of people were, were apprehensive to play him there because he had three missed cuts in a 41st. And then, it, look, he comes out, now he gained typical hat and like 10 strokes putting or whatever, but I don't really care about that. Uh, he can do that. That is an out you can have. I think he makes for an interesting play and an interesting bet uh, This, uh, you know, for the Masters. I think he could win. Sung Jae is the one who's just completely out of form. Obviously, in his debut at the Masters, he came in second place. That was in the November Masters when Dustin Johnson ended up running away with everything. He tied for Cam Smith that with Cam Smith that year. Missed the cut a year ago. Horrible form coming in. But his ownership right now, I'm looking at it might be like four percent. It's going to be low. And he fits in there as well, again, especially if Tiger does come into the mix and that changes things up as well. I just think overwhelmingly, like you said, this range, it just ne- it can't get the ownership. Guys want to play the ROMs, JTs, the ones we already talked about. The 9K, we hammered a bunch of guys. It's just so hard to get involved here that I think you pick your guys, take your stands. I've got no problem with M, Scott, Neiman, Hatton. The ones I have more of a challenge Fino. with. Give me some Fino. Hook it into my veins. Yeah, because see what I'm, I mean? Everyone's going to say that, though. I'm, that, I'm seeing them at like 17% owned already. Already. That's what I mean. <laughs> so you've got Fino. You've got, you know, Louis, the guy that's at the top. I just don't know where it's going to go completely, but I think it gets very, very dispersed besides Finau. So I'm comfortable with a few of those guys above and a few below and just getting different that way. Scott, for sure. I think you talked me into Sam Burns. I like that. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you wanted to get super galaxy brain, Ben, you could play Taylor Gooch, but I'm just not doing that. No, that's that's too much. I don't think... You know, of course, that's a way to be different. And, and I think everyone thinks he's overpriced. So then is he underpriced? And if he plays well, it doesn't matter what his price is in some regard. But there's so many ways to be different. I I look, it's not a direct pivot. There's three or four guys above him and three or four guys directly below him that I prefer. So uh, Neiman would be my favorite of the range, though. I really think that he's primed uh, to make a, his, certainly his best showing at the Masters in only a couple appearances. Do you worry that he kind of lost his form after the Genesis? A little, um, but at the same time, I thought he looked pretty good at the players. He really just couldn't get anything going on the greens, and that's something you know you have to live with. But his around the green game has really made strides. I think he's just a completely different player in every iteration we see him at these courses because he's still so young and he's getting better each and every year. He has gained around the greens in every event in 2022, which yeah. is mind-boggling considering when i bet him at the honda classic last year i think he lost seven strokes around the green <laughs> yeah that, that's not and that was fun. probably good and i you, mean for him that that's one of his better showings in you, 2021 it's just there, right? 
Yeah, bent grass? For, for, what, what about the bent grass angle as well? Didn't he? I think Greenbrier was bent grass, won on that. I think he's better on it. You talk about having around the green game, being able, being able to putt on these greens. I mentioned the little Sergio tidbit. He gets the tips from his boy. I think he can find his way around here at 8,200. And again, this is the opposite of the squeeze where we're willing to take above and below with uh, Hatton and Neiman instead of a Fino, which I understand why people want to pile on Fino. And it's the opposite of the course history factor. He has the great stuff. We're willing to go with guys that don't because, like Ben said, we're typically looking at three three and four times sample sizes. Who cares? So you are pro paying a little bit less for not the great stuff when the guy shows up. And uh, he'd be like, hey, you can pay like 15 bucks for this one. I hear it's a lot more potent. You don't want that one. You want the, the lesser quality? No, I, I just saying, I don't think he is that much of lesser quality when you actually compare them over time. But Finau's course history is outweighing things for people's minds right now. Neiman, only positive putting surface is bent grass. It's just very slightly gains 0.1 strokes per round on bent grass. He loses on Bermuda. He loses over two and a half strokes, or sorry, 0.25, a quarter of a stroke per round on POA, but he just won on POA. So maybe he's just developing into being a better putter overall. Yeah, better player overall too, I think, to Ben's point. Like he just, he's, for 8,200, think of the overall talent that the guy is. It's still, it seems pretty cheap for him. Well, it's funny, when we put yeah. these, when we put these guys into pairs, Ben, as I know like a lot of us like to do, like this guy is like the, the homeless man's this guy, but is there really that much of a difference between Neiman and Zalatoris? I was just going to say that, that exact thing. I don't think so. And then you've got like Cameron Young, uh, who we'll get to, uh, you know, soon enough. But how old is Neiman? Neiman's 23, I, I think. Similar That's age group saying. Yeah, to those guys. It's yeah. crazy. It's just he's been around for five years already. And I think people think of him as like, oh, well, his game is his game. And I, I don't think that's accurate at all. Yeah, he is 23 years old. The other guy who kind of falls into this trap, too, is 24-year-old Sung Jae. I was just going to say it. Who's been on tour for seven years or something. Yeah, <laughs> he plays every event, and so he shows up. You think he's played forever. But him and him and Neiman both, him and Neiman, get lumped in, and people forget they came into the same class, and they picked up Ws, like very good Ws along the way. That It's not like they haven't done everything that Hovland or Morikawa, Morikawa to a different level and extent because of the majors and then the WGC, but still, these guys have done their thing. It's not like they've come out and been failed failures on tour and now they're priced down here at 8400 and 8200 at a course that I think they can find their way around. Do you think that you could build a lineup one 9k guy be it Spieth, Cam Smith, Brooks let's say you lead your team off with Brooks go Brooks, Scott, Neiman, Hatton could that be a team? It, I mean, yes, it could be, but I think I would do it differently because I think to what we just talked about when talking about some of these guys what if you went Brooks, Zalatoris, M and Neiman? We just talked about them being like the lighter version. I'd rather play Scott than him. I don't care what the ownership is. Okay. Yeah. And I don't, I don't hate it. I'm just saying that's an example. So that you have the hundred bucks. So is my point. But what you could do, if you went Brooks, Scott, Neiman, Hatton, you still have $8,100 left. So you could do Zalatoris and then go down to. Yeah. Siwoo Kim's 26 years old, by the way. If people were wondering. That's crazy. He's too. not 35. Like yeah. you would kind of think for a guy that like won an event in 2016. We're, we're going to talk about him for sure. Yeah, I know, he should you, be I know you were going to. but 100% Siwoo Kim is what people need to be doing this week. <laughs> 7Ks. Answer is the first one up. So along with Hideki and Bryson and Tiger, now we're dealing with an injury for the Mexican Allen Iverson. 7900 bucks should rate out pretty well here. I don't know what's wrong with him. I really don't. Yeah, he came out. I saw I saw the Feinberg, your boy, tweeted the night before. Like he was mixing drinks, his tequila for people and, and serving them up. And the next day he was absolutely gutted that he could not contend in this event. And has to be something, Pat, more serious than we know, because think about it. We talked on the Wednesday show. It was, you know, his hometown, four hours away, his home course, sorry, and four hours away from his hometown with family and friends and everybody involved. He wanted to come out and play. I don't know what happened, but it definitely leaves me a little bit leery when you see him at 7,900 now with this range being so stacked otherwise. Wise. I can't imagine anyone's going to use him. Yeah, he has to be low owned. Will you use him, Ben? Probably not. And it's not because I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it as at a fraction of the ownership. It's just, it's such an opportunity cost because the high sevens to me is a really target rich environment. So I, I just, I don't feel the need to leverage there unless I go really chalky up top, but that's never going to happen because I would never play Cam Smith. More injuries. Paul Casey is $7,600, who gave everyone just a free roll at the match play, who was in his group. <laughs> Webb Simpson is $7,500, who his match play record looked a lot better than he actually played. He beat Brian Harmon shooting like a 74 or something <laughs> on the first day. He just, Brian Harmon just happened to play worse. You have these three guys. Casey would be the only one that has my interest out of them. 
Yeah. Um, answer to Ben's point, I just want to bring up quick, was the same as Scheffler up top. So Ben nailed it because like he can show up at 5% and it doesn't make me want to play him because I have other options I care about more where I would rather just allot that ownership to. But, uh, you know, you mentioned it here. I guess Casey, I'll definitely have interest. I don't really care about the one little injury if he comes out and plays. The guy almost won the players. Very unfortunate down the stretch to have that divot that he landed into. But the range is so stacked otherwise. And the web point you brought up, I know the match play situation, but he came out at Valspar, I believe it was four under and four like I think 67 67 or something to start off showing a little bit more life and he's another guy I'll definitely take chances on because when you've got Connors and Fitzpatrick and other guys in this range that are going to get ownership I want to talk about Fitzpatrick I don't think people are going to own Fitz people will own Fitzpatrick but the way that I'm seeing it right now Henley Connors Mark Leishman those three guys in the 7k range maybe even Max Homa at $7,100 because everyone loves Max Homa I put my faith into Max Homa a year ago at this course. Didn't work out all that well for Pat. Uh, any majors for Max <laughs> Homa either. It hasn't worked out very much so far. And that's truly interesting because I thought there would be more talk for Matt Fitzpatrick. I think this is a bad price. I think he's way too cheap. I think he's been better with the driver all around game. I don't really care the conditions either. I think even if it was like a 15 under or 16 under, it's getting there with a guy like him, but at 7,700, I think he can he can come through for you at that price. And it's interesting that like Henley and those guys are picking up more steam. I know the stats, but Fitzpatrick interests me quite a bit at 7,700. The stats are going to love Russell Henley every single week, right. regardless of what happens. But I don't know. I think that, I don't know if Fleetwood's a better player than Russell Henley. I know Matthew Fitzpatrick's a better player than Henley. So, and I know that Sergio is a better player than Henley too. He's won this event and hasn't made a cut since, obviously. But I feel like he's just playing a bit better, isn't he, Ben? He is playing better. Yeah, he has done absolutely nothing in the three, two or three appearances since then. The driver's automatic. The irons are, are not. I think the problem I have with Sergio again is that I really need to make room because I like Fitzpatrick a lot and I like I like Fleetwood a lot. I know that's probably a donkey move because I never get him right, but he's starting to flash it. The ball striking is back, not just in Europe. He's actually doing it here for a change. I think you can easily pair them and you're allocating, what, 15000 of your overall salary for those two? All right, I'll throw Fleetwood on the short list. Haven't made my mind up about Sergio or Fitzpatrick yet. I'm thinking I'm going to be in that range. Do you have interest in a Chalky Leishman? I do not, actually. I'm, uh, he was another one that you brought up that I was very surprised with. I can be talked in to quite a few other guys in that range, to be honest. And back to the Fleetwood point for Ben right quick, that's a good first-round leader bet as well. I'm, I'm eyeing that one up because he's actually done well here with that. He's done bad on the weekend. So uh, I could go to some Fleetwood here. Leishman, I do not. I would rather play Bubba Watson, actually. I could be talked <laughs> into him. And, it, you know, to me, it's more a history play than anything else. Hasn't he's been he? bad. He has. But I, who would you play? You don't have to play any of them. I'm just saying, but, like, Reed... Horschel or Bubba. I what think, about your boy, Seamus Power? I'm going to play him too. I was going to get there, Pat. I was waiting until we get to the very bottom, but I like Power as well. You were talking about a little bit today, those lightning fast greens. Man, I can't figure this guy out for the life of me. Like at, at first he was like only on easy courses and birdie fests, and then it was like never showing up at strong courses. Then last week he looked okay in the match play. He's been okay otherwise. So I don't know. I'm going to definitely play some Power. I, I'm not scared to, but I, I like some of the other guys in this range a bit more up at the top. I haven't really ever seen him do it at a long course. That would be the one thing. Miscut at the Genesis. Miscut at the Arnold Palmer, 33rd at the players. Like, that's not a long course at all. Yeah. Austin, not a long course. Phoenix, a bit longer. Misses the cut. Pebble Beach, top 10. Amex, shorter courses. Mm -hmm. And you have a top 15 finish. Sony, a very short course. Is he just a part of the Brian Stewart? He's like the good version of Brian Stewart. where Or Bryce Garnett. Like those very specific... Webb Simpson, Kevin Kisner. Like, is he a part of that mold of player where when we go to the Heritage next week... Sign up Seamus Power. When we're at the Masters, like the upside is really limited. I don't know. It obviously. makes sense to what you're saying. And it's almost like, because again, the other thing associated with him is we always talk about like the he can bomb it out there. Maybe he should be playing this course where he's laying it up and going like a Zach Johnson route to the top, but he won't do that. So that makes it worse of a play if that's the case. I just don't think he'll in, go with that, that game. In theory. fairness, Seamus Power is 40th in driving distance gained of the 91 players yeah. in this field. I think as Feinberg makes the mistake, just because his last name is Power doesn't necessarily mean he's a bomber. <laughs> yeah, it gets talked about a lot, actually. I do think that, so that could be true. But yeah, I don't know. Otherwise, 
that's why, I, like I said, I, you're going to have to play some uncomfortable guys. It's clear that the ownership is going to be, you know, congregate around 7,600 to that 7,900 range. So down below sort of the, you know, the Webb Simpson. What about Justin Rose? You talked about Adam Scott. That would be the one, Ben, that of these guys in the middle range, no one's going to use Rose if I just have to have blind faith of a guy to show up who's played well here before, whether it be between like Reed, Bubba, Horschel, Webb, Casey, like all those guys. I might be able to be talked into Casey, but I think that Rose is just kind of staring at me right here at $7,500 where he'll do it for, he'll be like in the mix for two and a half rounds. And you're like, you'll see him in the woods. You'll see him wherever. It's like, oh, but he's just randomly six under par. That's what he does at these things now. Yeah, I mean, he's got experience. He knows how to mitigate disaster. Him and Reed, to me, are very similar in that regard. Like, they, they bail themselves out of a lot. They get into big trouble and they make bogey. Uh, things like that are super, super important. He's someone I'll probably, uh, you know, kind of punt to see, is it going to be windy? What are we looking like? Like, it, it looks nasty for some reason. I would bump him up because I think he's uniquely suited to handle more adverse conditions. Here's how you win the million dollars this year. Ready? See, woo, Kim, Cameron Young, Robert McIntyre. Boom. And leave, and leave your boy Luke List out. Leave Luke List out. Because <laughs> we talked about those stats with Henley, and there's another guy that really pops in the stat models on Fantasy National, and that's going to be Luke List. I do think it depends on how he finishes at Valero. If he is in contention at Valero to win come Sunday, dude's going to be like 25% owned. And trust me, and a lot of people who are just... People will just jump in because it's the Masters. They'll throw in a lineup or two. They might not even know who Luke List is. They'll see he won at Torrey Pines. And I actually think that, like, objectively, List is probably a pretty good play. But it's going to be like an ownership fade for me if he ends up getting too high. If he's super low owned, I'll go in on List. But they're going to play List. Oh, he he just won the Valero. He won at Torrey Pines. And then they're going to watch him miss one foot putts at the Masters. Oh, it's going to be so painful for them, especially first timers. I love the Bobby Mack call. I also like the Cameron Young. I'll save it for Ben because he already mentioned him earlier. But I think Cam Young threatens my Sam Burns top debutant. But if you go to Bobby Mack, regardless of what he does this week, I don't think he'll ever, even if he did really well this week at Valero, I don't think he gets enough ownership that changes my thoughts on him. He's, you and I talked on Wednesday, Pat, how much he has to do at these events to show up. He's not getting like sponsors exemptions to regular season events, but at the big times like these, he has shown up at the majors. So I like playing him either way. Yeah. So Ben, I'll let you go on camera. But the thing about list is chalk list fade 6% list. All in play. That would be my, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's confirmed. Cam Young is, I mean, he's definitely someone I'm taking a look at. I, I tend to be certainly late on guys and I tend to not play these guys in these situations. And that still may be the case if he's somehow popular, but the ball striking the off the tee game is immense. And besides Si Wu, I'm okay with Max Homa. I I'm more comfortable, I think, than maybe you guys are, but there's just not a, a lot down here that I like. So I may have to make room for a guy like Cameron Young just because of the lack of opportunity cost. Jason Kokrak's going to be like 1% owed. No. Ugh. Probably should. For good reason. It maybe should be. Yeah, I know. we both kind of said the same, and you were even kind of hinting at it. But yeah, he's, he's a tough play. I really don't hate, like, people that watch this and watch it all the time will say, oh, he's just going, going on Siwoo again. I think people forget all the things you mentioned earlier on him. Like, he can, he's actually played pretty decent at this course. He can pop out of anywhere. And what was it last year? He broke his putter, and that was the, the narrative he around? He came 12th last year. So the, yeah. his fifth, four last finishes at the Masters, 24th, 21st, 34th, and 12th. I think 71, and you know he's going to score because he's going to put it in the water eight times and somehow make four <laughs> birdies in a row. Cause streak it out after the fact. I kind of like him more than List, even though List pops in the model. Like I say, low-owned. I'm more interested if List comes in low-owned, but I think with Siwoo, Bobby Mack, and then even Cam Young, I like that they put Cameron Young at 7,000. You and I talked off-air like a couple days ago about, you know, he probably will be popular. I'm not so sure, actually, with the $7,000 price tag and everything We that's thought that him. he would be 6,500. I thought 6,400, 6,500 would be like last year's Corey Connors. People see that. I don't think people play him at 7,000. Some will, but not to the extent that we care. Ben, Siwoo's form coming in is good for the first time ever. That honestly makes me, he's got a little oosty in him where that might be a false <laughs> positive that doesn't actually help him. But I've played Siwoo at the Masters and seems to be able to handle the course. Cut maker, returning results. He opens up a ton of, he fits so many different lineup builds. Uh, so I get it. I think he's going to be very popular. It could be your last man in, could be your fifth man in. So it makes sense, but I do think he will garner ownership as he should. I don't think that he's going to. I think that Max really? Homa in this range is going to suck up so much. And then Ki when we get to the sixes, Kisner is $6,800. You don't think that random dude is playing Kevin Kisner? 
Yeah, mo- more so to your second point is where I agree with 100%. Like, I, I don't know, because Homa fits the mold just going back up for two seconds. The, the history stuff we've talked about, but he's been so bad, not just at the Masters, but at majors across the yeah, board. Yeah, but he's popular online, Tampa. People like him. You're right. I, I do get that. But I will say to Ben's point, to cancel this out and, and segue us, is that most people want to end or have saw that the Millie Maker winner lineups end with a 6600 or a $6,800 guy. And so just start perusing this range and pick one. Like Ben just said, if Siwoo Kim is your last guy in the lineup, regardless of ownership, you're probably already like, we're not on Cam Smith up there and some of the other guys that are more popular. If he's your sixth man. You've got to feel pretty good about that lineup. I don't care what else is in it. It's got to look damn good. How about we each win one of the Millionaire Makers apiece with a final lineup of Siwoo and Luke List? That'd be a real oh, good gosh. good note for this show, I think. I'll make it. That'll be my one that I tweet out, say the, the Mayo one. We'll do it after Wednesday. Whatever our sure. Wednesday thoughts are, I'll, I'll start with those two and then start fitting in our thoughts, and I'll put it in something a bit bigger and see what happens. One guy we just completely glossed over, like the, you're going to have to make your own decisions on the Roses and the Reeds and the Bubbas of the world. Like if that's for you, it could really pay off. It, or you could be sitting there 20 minutes into Thursday being like, what the fuck was I thinking? It was a disaster. Horschel, who has sucked at the Masters in his career, but playing amazing coming in. What do we do? Stay off him? Fade? Yeah, I think so. I don't. I think, but like to your point about Homa in the history, I think he will be under-owned because A, people hate Billy Horschel. B, he sucked at the Masters over his career. I think it will, like, at this price point, based on the way that he has played, he should be 20%. He's going to be like nine. Yeah, there's something about Billy for me. It's more of like a Florida thing. Like if he's not in Florida on those Bermuda greens and doing his thing, and, you know, he, he is streaky. We've talked about this throughout this run. So maybe, but... You know, him showing up at match play, you know, a couple events before that doesn't change much for me where I all of a sudden love him at 7,400 and just too many other guys. I'll take the chances on the dudes we already talked about. Webb, Bubba, P- Power, Siwoo, List, all those guys we mentioned, I'd rather them. Would you think that if you don't play Billy Horschel, Ben, that he might sneak attack you with his putting stance and beat you over the head with the putter? It seems probable. Um, <laughs> but if he's not going to beat me to death on Bermuda Greens... I have no interest because that's Tambo hit it. Florida swing. This guy turns it on. I, I think there is a hard reset here. And, you know, again, if you're talking the large Millie, you can make a case for, for a lot of guys, but I don't know how I hone in on, on Horschel in, in lineups where I have a, a finite amount uh, of shares. I don't think he's a priority. So if you become a member at fantasynational.com this week, fantasynational.com slash mayo to get yourself that 20% off right now, and you use the ownership projections, you should be aware of a few things. Because Kevin Kisner at $6,800, I truly believe is going to be 15 to 20% owned this week. Fantasy National users are using him at a 1% clip. Because I think that they are anticipating what is coming with Kisner and just crossing him off. Yeah, I think that's going to be the case as well. I do think there'll be some sentiment around the fact that, you know, he's he's always been good at match play. Austin's his thing. That's where he collects his paycheck. Yes, he had the one year. I know he was even on the Millie Maker winner that year. He came T18 or whatever at the Masters. Yeah, he's actually never finished in the top 20 at the Masters. He was T21 there it was. in 2009, the Tiger year. Yeah. So that, that's the case. And that year, I believe he was 6,600 or 6,800, somewhere in this range. And he'd been on record before that, like a couple weeks before saying that this is not his course. He doesn't expect to show up. And then he showed up and ended up on those lineups. So that was the interesting point. But there's too many other guys down here for me anyway. And so I'm sure that's what some of those users are saying as well. I, if you're going to take like similar type of that player, I'd rather use Na over using Kevin Kisner. For one thing, guy has back-to-back top 15 finishes at the Masters. And for whatever reason, like Kevin Na has his certain joints where he puts, we talk about those fast bent grass greens. That's a Kevin Na experience, put it that way. He knows what he's doing on these greens. It's never really been a problem for him. But if we're talking about the 6K guys, you say you might not even want to go down here or maybe use one guy. Ben, do you feel the same way that you might not be loading up in the sixes? So I may have to if I go really aggressive up top, but I think I'm very comfortable landing in the sevens. I don't, I'll get it out there. I don't like Kisner at all in the spot. The time to play Kisner was if you were able to get to him uh, kind of at the players, certainly a better fit for him. And he he was so good around the green with the putter. I just don't see that here. If I was playing that guy, you mentioned not, I would probably play Bez, uh, who is similar to them as well. I feel a little more comfortable made cut equity, things like that. I think he'll find the weekend pretty comfortably. And he's a, you know, the way he putts, he can really score. Harris English isn't playing, right? WD yesterday. Okay, he did WD. Yeah. All right. Because I, I didn't see like the, uh, the out next up, to his yeah. name. It was I in was the like, mix of all the other stuff. That's why. Like, just get him off of it here. So what are we doing down here? 
can we play Cameron Champ at $6,600? Because you know no one's going to play him. He's never missed a cut at the Masters. Maybe he's just one of these guys who has it figured out. Uh, I'm not playing him. I think I'm going to play him. Him and Thomas Peters. Sign me up. Definitely playing some Peters. I was going to say not only a first-round leader bet, if you remember back, I think it was the year he came fourth or something, so that lead was there. But also, again, when you talked about it earlier, this is the prototypical guy we want to talk about down here. Do you want to play Fred Couples and hope he finds the magic bean spots where you land it perfectly and roll it down to the hole and you get that highlight and he makes the cut and comes 49th? Or do you want to risk the missed cut with Peters but know that if he comes through, he can get you a top 20? That's what we want to do with Peters. And then one guy you didn't even mentioned that I, we're talking lefties i know you like lefties you mentioned bobby mack but brian Harmon. no he go yeah you're gonna go to him later i knew that i forgot about that but brian Harmon is my guy we always do you like a good ranking on you know this what? show for me you know what rank the lefties for me here give, give me give me yeah so here here we go oh, tambo God, here ready we, go. we got molinari Harmon, kisner na bez hoagie i think you can lump all six of those guys in together that's way too many to list i got i've got they're all in an order you're looking at it okokay i've got i've got Harmon first is all i was gonna uh. say because i had Harmon over na over kisner for my rankings in the 6800 dollars range was i was trying to bring a, a ranking system to this you pop six guys on me and i can see a few of them on screen but i don't mind your higo call and but i do like bobby mack if we're talking overall, I was just talking $6,800 range. I like Harmon. So Bobby Mack, then Harmon are the two I have interest in. Garrick Higo, he of maybe a miscut streak of 84 consecutive events. Ben, let's do it. Fire up some Garrick Higo. Sure, why not? Uh, what about Wolf? If yeah. you're just going to go mega insane. Nah, I'd rather play Champ. Yeah, I think they accomplished the same thing, which is a miscut. Uh, but hey, Champ has never missed the cut, though. So he's due. No, uh, not due. Never going to happen. Ever. Stuart Sink <laughs> is coming off the seventh. Davis. Yeah. <sighs> Stuart Sink's coming off a seventh of the Valspar. Wasn't he like 10th last year? Yeah. I, I was going to say two guys I like Stewie Sink. And the guy you mentioned earlier was a little bit of a joke, but I actually don't mind Mac Hughes. 6,300. Uh, to me, that's just a decent price. You know what's going to happen. You know, try it out. Him, Stewie Sink, two that stood out. And then one guy I was contemplating on was Harold Varner. Only because he's a really good ball striker. And people might forget this, but an 18th, a 6th, and the win in Saudi, that's like in his last five events. The guy's looked pretty good. He's coming in here at 6,600. He had the baby swag that led into all that, but, you know, got his way in here. So I'm interested to see Harold Varner at 6,600 as well. That's really interesting. Do you have any sort of lean on Varner as a debutant, Ben? So I definitely think it's, you know, there's not that many names that I think are realistic plays here. He's someone I'm comparing against someone like Ryan Palmer, who's been playing terrible, but he's kind of showing it. We don't know where he finishes at Valero. Ryan Palmer's got experience here. I don't think it's the best course in the world, but we're, we're truly asking, can you make the weekend and rack up birdies? He would be the type of guy who could most definitely do that. I was even looking down a little bit farther here. Like, Higo is just a pure YOLO play for me. Yeah. It's going with, I believe that he is going to win the Masters at some point in his career. Why not the first time he shows up? <laughs> he, he just he has real Masters feel to me. Left-hander, South African, bombs it. Did you bet him? I haven't bet him yet. I wonder his odds, though. I'm I, assuming I, they're going to be 4,000 to 1 yeah. or something. But of the other guys, like, I have no interest in Zach Johnson. The glove is making a run at Valero right now. He's $6,400. He's another one. If he finishes, like, third at Valero at $6,400, just pencil him in for 15%. Yeah. And then he's an easy fade. I'm, I'd still be off him. I'm just, like I said, even if he makes the run here, that's what's funny. Someone will do something this week, and all of a sudden they're the best play. Uh, Ryan Palmer doesn't need to win the Masters. He already won the Zurich, which takes place in three weeks, when he mas he paired up with Scotty Scheffler yeah, now. He, he only gets – apparently that's, yeah. that's the rule on tour. At the, Valer, at the Zurich Classic, his partner has to be the number one player in the world. <laughs> yeah, so he doesn't need this W. He's already got one coming in three weeks. I, I don't have much else down here. Like I said, Varner was the guy that I would will, be willing to take a shot on. I like your Hughes call just because it's, we make fun of him, but he does find it at times. And again, you're talking about potential eagles, some around the green crazy stuff that just can punch him up the board. DraftKings scoring wise, it's 6,300. If you want to unlock your lineup, that's the way to do it. The only one model wise in the $6,000 range that rates inside the top 30 overall is Tom Hoagie, who has never played this course before, Ben. Yeah, that's going to be a no uh, for me. He is, obviously, he's taken some strides. He's been fantastic. I still think his around the green game, which has been much better. I just worry about that in a situation where he's never seen this course. It's kind of different. And 
he's at a range where there are plays for me. Bez, we didn't talk about EVR. I think that's a mega mind genius play <laughs> in large field tournaments. Uh, so there are names there. Just looking at the history of like some of the guys who are down here, Schwartzel is $6,200. Oh, yeah. I, I know that's your guy. Obviously, he's a former winner. I would say he's different than the rest of the former winner category. He still has a bit of juice <laughs> left. He's come T25, T26 the last two years. I mean, him and Willett, I think, are in like a, a, their own tier of, I don't think they're really playable, but they're not uh, Sandy Lyle. In fairness, Sch Schwartzel has missed six consecutive cuts, and he had that great clip of him throwing his club at the Valspar as well. <laughs> Will it's Alley? Will it? I think would be in play as if we look on Wednesday night, and the weather report is like, "Oh, there's 40 mile per hour winds every day." Then I think you can use Danny Willett. Yeah, and Zach Johnson. No, Zach Johnson is so much closer to larry mize than he is to like good players at this point at the masters it's truly insane i because you think like zach johnson he still plays on the pga tour he's fine whatever and then you go look at his like his history over the past five years here it's he's one of those guys that if he makes the cut he's coming 49th yeah if he can hit his practice shot off the tee <laughs> i don't know if that's a bit or not still but it's happened three times now so i, I don't know what his game is but uh, i definitely won't be playing him all right, so I think we're good on the 6K range. Not a lot of options. Like, if you can if you can end your teams by not Kisner, and maybe you want to use Peters, or maybe you want to use Bez, whoever it may be, not Kisner, I think, because he's going to be super chalky. Molinari is probably tough to deal with. We didn't talk Woodland, but he's never really been good here. If conditions are horrendous, Westwood, I think, would be in play. But McIntyre, Young, List, Siwoo. End with two of those guys, and I think you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I like that quite a bit. And if you did have to go to the 6K range, which I'd have no problem doing, it's the guys like Ben said, or you had mentioned, where we take shots on guys like Bez, EVR, Peters, Varner. Pick your choice. I'm just saying at least those guys could be 7K. Like you could see some of those guys flip-flop. I don't think you need to go down completely to the bottom of the 6K range. All right, well, let's unpack this because we got it so wrong we did the players show early. We thought about who was going to be in the play the best plays lineup because we was like, oh yeah, Casey, Rory, and then all those guys missed the cut. Then no one ended up using them at the players. Uh, you know, because Rory had the bad weekend and Casey had the bad weekend <laughs> at API when we did that show. So where do you think we start here? Do you think it starts with Rom or Thomas? Or do we just lock in Cam Smith right now? Cam Smith, we start with. Okay. He, that can't change, right, Ben? So he's definitely in the lineup. It's just a question. I don't know uh this this um, these guys do they play someone north of 10k every time not necessarily especially at a tournament okay. like this where there's like names that they've won with that are in the 9ks i think kisner's a lock to be in this lineup just gonna say that i was scrolling down to him okay here. so that gives us smith and kisner to start off the play the best plays lineup at eighty three hundred dollars left for the four players does that mean we go to rom or thomas or do we use xander I think that's the decision we have to make here. One of those guys is in this lineup. I'm thinking Thomas. Yeah. I, I like Thomas. Oh, I was going to say Thomas or Ron, but I, I like going there because I think people will, especially because once we plug in Thomas, you still have over $7,600, which people are going to be comfortable with. So, yeah. Can you sign off on that, Ben? I can sign off on that. Do, does, do you think people will play Tiger or does he's a separate category? I think, he, he, I think he's a separate category. I would say so, too. I was looking at Leishman, maybe, for this. Um, Did Corey Connors make the cut at Valero? Depends what he's doing he right now. He's playing pretty well. He's so let's go Thomas Connors. Because, you know, if Connors finishes, his like, okay. He's on the course as we speak. Go ahead, plug him in. I'm going to pull it. So 7600 At least $7,700 left for two spots. So looking at ownership, you have Leishman, Henley. You could go Henley and Finau, I think. I think that fits. Ugh. Wait, who? Henley, then Finau? No, that doesn't work. You could go Henley and Leishman. Leishman and, Leishman yeah. and Finau would work. I think, should we plug Leishman, in Finau yeah. anyway? Like, I feel like Finau, you said he was 17% already, and I, I don't know. I'm trying to plug. That actually works out with $0 left over, Finau and Leishman. Yep. So Finau's about to make the cut. He's sitting T24. So he's fine. People will look at his ball striking numbers and be like, yeah, Tony's fine. Don't worry about him. Great history. I'm not even necessarily inclined to disagree 
with those people. I think that Finau could do really well at the Masters, but if we're playing 150 lineups for me with 25 <laughs> lineups, I think that he ends up being a casualty because I want to play Adam Scott instead. Leishman at $7,300 makes it a zero-sum game. You're, we've used all $50,000. Ben, that's what play the play, play the best play lineup guy loves to do. Have zero dollars remaining. There it is. All right. That's our first look at the Masters on DraftKings for 2022. Reminder, once again, help us out. Subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast on Apple Podcasts. Leave a five-star review, something nice, Twitter handle or email so I can contact you if you're a winner. That puts you in the draw for both a free one-and-done ticket at fantasygolfchampionships.com. And if you don't want that, you can get in the draw for all the swag, the Masters swag that's coming around. So please go do that. It helps out the show tremendously. And we're making a push here. we got some great shows coming up next week too. Tambo, when is Fantasy Golf Degenerates on the Mayo Media Network coming out this week? It'll be coming out Sunday evening. So we're going to record it Sunday afternoon, get it out Sunday evening. The show will be on the YouTube channel, the podcast, everywhere that you can find your podcasts. Ben Raza, awesomeo.com. What do you guys got going on? Yeah, so of course we'll have uh, nonstop Masters coverage next week from shows to articles and of course all the tools and the projections. So if you're looking uh, to get some more golf content, come on over. Even if it's just for the week, we would love to have you as part of the community. Do you have any sort of promo code you can give people? So go to awesomeo.com slash promos and you get all the promo codes because we got a million different things going on. Easy, easy. And you can sign up um, for whatever you want. We'd love to see you in there. Tambo. RunPureSports.com. What's your guys' promo? Right now, you can go over and use DGEN50. We've got it still from the Fantasy Golf Degenerates podcast. So D-E-G-E-N-5-0, 50% off your first month. It's actually one sport, all pr- one, one price, all sports. So you don't have to worry about looking for the golf package or anything. Just get everything in one. Well, if you are golf specific and you want to do your own research, as I know people on the internet enjoy to do these days and then tell people about it. Because if you don't do your own research, you're probably a sheep. Are you a sheep? But if you're not a sheep, you should get FantasyNational.com. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo gets you the 20% off ownership projections lineup generator simulator and the easiest to use stat database on the planet customize it any way you want the DraftKings listeners league is in the description the free newsletter sign up for that right now you'll get more giveaways i'm giving over like a thousand bucks this week just away to you the good people out there but you're going to need to be subscribed to the free newsletter in order to do that i'll have one sunday monday tuesday and wednesday with all the updated info get sent right to you and you'll find all the hyperlinks all the shows everything you need consolidated all in that one spot. Sub to the Mayo Media Network, smash the like to the episode, and play in the giant one and done. Once again, $100 to play, 10K for first place, fantasygolfchampionships.com. I'm Pat Mayo. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!